Hello, and welcome to our short form service for the first Sunday in October. Our theme is a godly heart. What we will be considering can be summed up in a verse from each of two hymns. In his hymn, Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, Charles Wesley describes such a heart with verse 2 telling us it should be resigned, submissive, meek, by great Redeemer's throne, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone. The wonderfully named Folliot Sanford Pierpoint in writing of the love which envelops us from birth, wrote, For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, pleasures pure and undefiled, gracious God, to you we raise this our sacrifice of praise. In our opening prayer, we offer praise and thanks to God for human love. After this prayer, you may want to pause the video and offer your own prayers of thanks, and then perhaps use the Lord's Prayer. But let us now pray together. Loving Creator God, we praise and thank you for the wonderful way in which you have made us. We praise and thank you for the love you have placed in our hearts and the many ways we can express love. We especially praise and thank you that we can care lovingly for others and that we are cared for by so many of our family neighbours and friends. We recognise that our loving is but a pale reflection of your loving care for us. Help us to reflect more fully the light of your love and the depth of your caring in our lives. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and to test him they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. The disciples st spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms laid his hands on them and blessed them. When I first looked at this gospel reading for today, my reaction was, let's find a different passage. 
The first part of this is too contentious and difficult. But that is escapist. And we will see that the passage has much to offer far beyond the narrow confines of ancient Jewish rules about divorce. The clues to the wider meaning of the divorce argument lie both in the verse leading into the passage and in the position of the argument in Mark's Gospel. The leading usually reads something like he, that is Jesus, left that place, Capernaum, where the prior chapters is set, and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. This implies that Jesus travelled through Samaria to get from Capernaum in Galilee south to Judea and then east across the Jordan to the largely Gentile area of Perea. It was here in Gentile Perea that the Pharisees challenged Jesus. Why here and not in Jewish Judea? At the time that Jesus made this journey, both Galilee and Perea were ruled by Herod Antipas, one of the four sons of Herod the Great. As we know from the Gospels, including Mark, Herod Antipas had divorced his first wife and married the wife of his brother. And as everyone knew, matters were even more murky than Mark recalls. Herod Antipas' new wife, Herodias, was his niece, and she had instigated her divorce from Philip, something permitted by Roman and Greek law, but not by Jewish law. So by placing the story in Herod's territory, Mark is signalling that the whole story is a political commentary on the marriage of Herod Antipas and Herodias. Exactly the issue which had led to the imprisonment, subsequent execution of John the Baptist. And to be sure nobody misses the significance Mark tells of Jesus talking with his disciples of a woman divorcing her husband. Now we must ask why Mark has placed the story in the group of stories between the Transfiguration at the start of what we know as chapter 9 and the story of blind Bartimaeus the day before the entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday at the end of chapter 10. And why does the divorce argument lead straight into the metaphor, the picture of citizens of God's kingdom being children? The central meaning of the transfiguration story is that Jesus and the kingdom he is initiating are in direct descent from the law, the figure of Moses, and the prophets, the figure of Elijah. Then, in preparation for the stories of Holy Week, Mark collects together some stories which illustrate how the kingdom initiated by Jesus through his death and resurrection will be a development, a fulfillment of what is in the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. Mark's contemporaries would immediately realize that he sees this story 
as exemplifying how Jesus dealt with the political trickery of the Pharisees and at the same time displayed a truth concerning God's kingdom. In response to the Pharisees' challenge about divorce law, Jesus does what the great Pharisees have always done. He quotes passages of scripture and seeks to harmonize what at first sight are conflicting messages. He does this by accepting the permissive law as a last resort and setting up stricter rules as a fence around the clear law. The idea is that by trying to live according to the stricter rule, no divorce, you maximize the likelihood that you will never need to use the undesirable permissive law. A man may divorce his wife. So Jesus gets the Pharisees to state the clear permissive law. They rely on chapter 24 of the fifth book of the Torah or law, Deuteronomy, which says that a man can write his wife a certificate of divorce, put it in her hand and send her out of his house if she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. Jesus then turns to verses in Genesis, the first book of the Torah. From the first story of creation, he quotes from the thinking about gender. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. He then links this with a quote from the second story of creation. A man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. This quote has an obvious sexual significance, but it is much more profound the very next sentence, not quoted by Jesus, but remembered by most of his contemporaries and certainly by the Pharisees, reads, The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Nothing was hidden between them. And surely this also is not simply a physical statement. In his hymn, Thou God of Truth and Love, We Seek Thy Perfect Way, Giles Wesley sets out this much wider meaning. He writes of the oneness of humanity across time and space and the oneness of each of us with God. Here is verse 3. Didst thou not make us one that we might one remain, together travel on and share our joy and pain, till all thy utmost goodness prove and rise renewed, in perfect love. The first part of the verse, just like Jesus' quote, sounds like it applies to a couple, but suddenly it is expanded to all. This oneness of humanity is what God wishes for the earth. This is what we pray for when we ask for God's kingdom to come on earth 
as in heaven. A oneness so profound, so practical, that Jesus journeys from Galilee to Judea via Samaria. A route that would prompt the question, why on earth did he go that way? All Jesus' Jewish contemporaries knew that to avoid contact with Samaritans, Jews from Galilee would travel down the east side of the Jordan and then cross back from Perea to Judea. Let's jump forward to our 21st century. Six days after the MP Joe Cox was murdered in 2016, her friends organised a memorial in Trafalgar Square called More in Common. And on the day of her death, her widower issued a statement which included the sentence, hate doesn't have a creed, race or religion. It is poisonous. And of course, such hate led to an untimely death. This morning's gospel speaks to hate's opposite, love. Equally, love does not have a creed, race or religion, but love is life-affirming. And surely that is emphasised by Mark in the story of the children coming to Jesus immediately after the divorce argument. Mark is using the argument between the Pharisees and Jesus on divorce to point to wider realities of life. He's making the clear point that humankind has been created diverse in many, many ways but at the level of our fundamental humanity, we have more in common. We are as one, all of us, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above. Using common phrases in our English language, we are called to think as one, to act as one, and to do that, we have to be fully open to each other. We must speak heart to heart with each other, and each of us with God. In all of this togetherness, it is vital that everything is done in love, that only Christ is heard to speak. In other words, as citizens of God's kingdom, Jesus must reign alone in our hearts. In a phrase, we must have godly hearts. Amen. This service was recorded at Tossumber Hill Fort in Cokerdale, Northumberland. This settlement was active about two and a half to three thousand years ago. That is the time frame of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. Throughout this time and longer, humans have striven to live in harmony with each other and with creation. Our human journey in God's creation goes on. A central claim of our faith is that the creator of the universe is with us on this journey, seeking to support and guide humankind by speaking heart to heart with us. It is to this loving creator that we have given praise in this service. 
wherever we are, God is with us with a peace that passes all understanding and a loving, saving, guiding and energising presence in our hearts. Go in that peace. And may the God of peace go with you forever. Amen. <laughs>